Des mots qui me gênent, des centaines de mots, des milliers de rengaines qui sont jamais les mêmes. Comment te dire, je veux pas te mentir, tu m'attires et c'est là que se trouve le vrai fond du problème. First, uh, I think we should start off with a little uh, squeeze game, okay? So, so here's here's how the squeeze game is played. Suppose I've got a number here. I'm not going to tell you what it is. So we're going to make it a little unknown number. Suppose that number is less than, say, something like 20. Uh, that leaves it open to a bunch of numbers. It could be 19, 18, 17, or 16 and a half. It could be a whole bunch of things. But suppose I also tell you that that number has to be bigger than 2. Well, that narrows it down. That means that number has got to be uh, between 2 and 20. So we say that the number here is squeezed. It's uh, squeezed between 2 and 20. Okay, and that's how we play the squeeze game. We squeeze something between two numbers, and once we have that, it's squeezed. Uh, let's have a couple more examples. This, a couple more examples where we uh, play the uh, squeeze game. Suppose I've got a number between 5 and 20. What is it? I guess, well, maybe it's 17. Nope, it's 11. Let's play the, the game again. Suppose I've got a number between 5 and 20. Here, I'm going to... Well, I did that. I showed you guys what it is. All right, so... It's uh, 11. And let's play the number the game again. I've got a number between 5 and 20. What is it? 11? No, nope, it's 13. Uh, and you guess again. We could play this game a whole bunch of times, but it's not that fun when you can't guess what it is. Often, uh, you can improve your chances if you do a little bit more squeezing. So you can change the game from just squeezing to squeeze more. The more you squeeze, the more it narrows it down, and so you, the game becomes a little easier. So, a number between 5 and 6, and you might think, well, maybe it's uh, 5.2. Yeah, you guessed it. Maybe it's 5.3. No, it's 5.51. Well, the point is, it still leaves a lot of possibilities uh, for that number to be squeezed. Uh, if these guys are, are different, or the 5 and the 6 are different, uh, the number of things that could be squeezed in there is really infinite. So, more squeezing, it's alright, but it's not quite enough. What we really want is the ultimate squeezing. Serious squeezing. That would happen in the following scenario. Suppose I told you I've got a number between 5 and 5. What could that number possibly be? If it's less than or equal to 5, and it's also bigger than or equal to 5, that leaves only one choice. It has to be 5. That is some serious, serious squeezing. Because you're squeezing a number between 5 and 5, and there's only one thing that fits in there, namely a 5. And you can play this game all day long. This one is called a, a Serious Squeezing, um, because you're really squeezing. What number fits between 6 and 6? There's only one thing that can squeeze in there. That, of course, would be 6, and you can apply it to anything where the numbers match. And you may wonder, well, what does that have to do with our calculus course? Well, it has a lot to do with it. Um, in this uh, famous theorem called the squeeze theorem. It says that if you've got real functions, you, know, you can basically slap a limit on both sides. Uh, if, you, if f is always, for all possible real numbers, f is smaller than g or equal to g, you can slap a limit on both sides and the limit of this f will be, the lim will be smaller or equal than the limit of g. Of course, approaching the same value, x goes to c in both cases. And that, of course, is assuming that the limit exists. Let me give you a picture of what's going on here. Suppose you've got a uh, function f here. Oops. Um, function f is here. I'll call this f of x. And suppose that one is smaller than function g, uh, g of x, which is bigger. And suppose you've got some number c here. So as you as your h's x's approach a c, of course, this will be the limit of f, and it has to be smaller than the limit of g. This would be the limit of g. It couldn't be the other way around because f is always staying underneath the g curve. If it's always staying underneath, then the best prediction as you move towards c must be a smaller prediction in value than compared to the prediction as you move towards c on the values of g. Right? That makes sense. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that you can just slap a limit on both sides and uh, everything will be alright. Uh, of course, assuming the limits exist. But uh, that's not very squeezy. We're back to uh, nothing's being squeezed. Um, we need to take it up a couple notches, and then you'll start to see the uh, the squeezing. Um, 
suppose you apply it to three different functions. So you've got three functions. You've got an H, you've got a G, uh, H, F, and a G. Um, and they're like this. Uh, whoa, not like that. Uh, H is smaller, F is in the middle, and G is on top. Then at any given point uh, C, of course, the limit of F will be... Um, uh, stuck between the limits uh, uh, of G and H respectively as X approaches uh, C. Um, that's applying the same thing but applied to uh, three different uh, functions all at the same time. Um, still, well, there's nothing squeezy there unless we can make uh, the outside values match. Uh, if the outside values don't match, you're not squeezing very much at all. Uh, leaves it open to just about anything. So, so something magical happens here when this value uh, matches that one. Suppose they were both 7 and 7. Then you've got some real serious squeezing going on here. Then you've squeezed this number here between 7 and 7, so it must be 7. Uh, or if you squeeze this one between 8 and 8. If this number squeezed between 8 and 8, well, it has to be 8. More than that, the uh, squeeze theorem uh, also tells you that so long as this one exists and that one exists and they match, it forces this one to exist. So it alleviates a little bit of that condition that each of the limits must exist. Uh, if these ones exist and they match, they're equal to each other, that forces this one to exist. Um, which is a nice feature for uh, the squeeze theorem. But uh, talk is cheap, man. What does that exactly mean? Again, if you squeeze this limit between 5 and 5, of course it has to be 5. If you squeeze it between 7 and 7, it has to be 7, and it has to exist. Between 18 and 18, and it has to be 18, and it has to exist, etc., etc. Uh, talk is cheap. Let's see an example. So you get some limit uh, expression here, so some uh, proposed problem to find a limit. Here's how we can play the squeeze uh, game. Okay, you ready? Here we go playing the squeeze uh, game. So here we go, let's try an example. Um, suppose you've got some function like this, uh, 1 over uh, x plus 7 times the square root of x plus 1. Right? And, and make a note of the, the x's here, they're going towards infinity, so you can assume they're large and positive and going towards infinity. Um, that means positive, positive, everything's positive here. We can assume without loss of generality. So this guy's got to be bigger than or equal to zero because it's positive. But on the other hand, you can also assume that this is uh, smaller than or equal to uh, 1 over x. And you may wonder why, how can you assume that? Well, it's this funny thing about fractions that when you make the denominator smaller, you make the quotient bigger. Okay, I'll let you think about that. Um, if you haven't ever thought about that, but it's true. If you make the denominator smaller, you make the quotient bigger. So therefore, this one's bigger than that one. You're dividing by something smaller. Now, uh, let's do, let's do a little squeeze here. Uh, I'm gonna take the limit. Um, I'm gonna take the limit of this as x uh, goes towards infinity, and I'll slip, slap the limit as, on here as x goes towards infinity. And I'll slap the limit here as x goes towards infinity. And notice what happens here. Now, this is a constant, so this becomes a zero. That becomes less than or equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x plus uh, 7 times the square root of x plus 1. And all that is less than or equal to this limit, which happens to be a relatively mild and easy limit to compute. The limit of 1 over x as x goes towards infinity, of course, is zero. And what that does is it reduces, it simplifies this limit. It must be squeezed between 0 and 0. Um, therefore, two things happen as a consequence out of the, fun, out of the, uh, the uh, squeeze theorem. One of the things that happens is that this limit must exist, since these match. And, of course, it must be 0, since it's squeezed between 0 and 0. So we've got success. This is a classic example of uh, how we would use a squeeze theorem. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Um, let's see, another example, we did that one, how about this one? Again, uh, the idea here is to squeeze it between easier limits, and so 
So here, 3x minus 1 all over x squared plus 2. I could say that that's less than or equal to, and uh, as long as I can make the denominator smaller, I'm good. Or the, the numerator should be made smaller, so I can make it 1. 1 is definitely smaller than 3x minus 1 for large x's. And the bottom I'll just make it x squared, since that's making the denominator smaller, it will make the quotient bigger. And of course, uh, large x's would make this a positive, so there you go, we did it again. Um, whoops, we did it again. Um, we squeezed it between, let's go with yellow now, yellow limits as x goes towards infinity, the limits, where I'm slapping the limit on everything, slapping the limit, and already smelling success because look what's going to happen here. Uh, this one is going to go to zero, and this one of course is a well-known limit, it's going to go to zero. And I've got this character here stuck between zero and zero with no choice but to exist and to be zero. Yippee Okay. Pretty interesting, huh? Want to see it again? Um, let's have another example. Suppose you've got something like, uh, like this. Uh, uh, it's too easy. Too easy. Let's try something like this. Um, and let's go with yellow. So 2 uh, cosine of x plus 5 sine of x all over x. That's got to be less than or equal to uh, 7 over x. Why, you may ask? Well, think about it. This is a cosine, which is a ratio of adjacent to hypotenuse, which can never be 1 or larger than 1 or less than negative 1. So this is number stuck between 2 and negative 2. Similarly, this one's stuck between 5 and negative 5 because the sine is stuck between 1 and negative 1. So the whole thing could never ever hope to be more than or equal to 7 uh, or less than or equal to negative 7 over x. Right? And now we play the uh, the uh, limit game here. Um, take the limit as, uh, we'll go with the white limits as x goes towards infinity on everything. Take the limit as x goes towards infinity. Take the limit as x goes towards infinity, and already we can see this is going somewhere. This is a well-known famous limit. This is equal to zero, and that's less than or equal to limit as x goes towards infinity of two cosine x plus five sine x all over x, and that's less than or equal to zero. Leaving this guy in here with no choice but to exist. It must exist and be zero. I told you. That's why they pay me. But that's nothing. Uh, those are all pretty uh, uh, silly little squeezings. Um, I think it's time for some beautiful squeezing. Uh, we'll make this our last example here. You guys ready? This will be a good coffee break time. Ready if you want to pause it. Um, this is probably the most well-known example. Uh, it's some very, very beautiful squeezing. Let's do it. I'm going to pause this. Just get your break on. Salute. All right. This is the squeeze theorem um, on its finest hour. So we talked about this limit before on numerous occasions. It's a famous limit. We've been talking about it since the beginning of the course. Here we'll take this opportunity to find the, uh, the limit from the right um, using the squeeze theorem. Don't let it bother you that we're only doing it from the right. You could easily modify these ideas to, to do it from the left and complete the entire uh, both-sided limit. All right, so here it goes. Talk is cheap. This proof begins with uh, observation about this uh, little wedge. Um, suppose this wedge has angle theta on it. And suppose that this length is 1 and that length is 1. You may wonder... Well, how much, how big is this area? And you may remember, well, I took a good algebra course and I know that that area is equal to uh, theta over 2 times the radius square. But since the radius is 1, of course, in this case, uh, it's just theta over 2. So, okay, that's no big deal. That's theta over 2. So what? That has nothing to do with the squeeze theorem. Or does it? Then you go on to... Um, the next idea, and you say, well, okay, how, is, how does this wedge compare with a 
corresponding triangle that happened that uh, is constructed by taking these endpoints and joining them. Um, instead of making the arc here, of course, you, which do you think would be bigger? The wedge would have a bigger area than the area of the triangle. And uh, and you may wonder, oh, it might be it might be a fun exercise to try to find the area of this triangle. Uh, again, this is theta. This is one. This is one. And we find out that this area is theta over two. How about that one? Well, this is one, and as you all know, the area of a triangle is usually base times height divided by two. And of course, the base would be one. So it's one. The height would be theta. This would be, um, I don't know, you could call it h. And you get some something like this uh, going on. You get something like this uh, sine of theta is equal to h, uh, uh, it's opposite of our hypotenuse, uh, so h is equal to sine theta. So therefore this would be 1 times uh, sine theta all over 2. Or said differently, it's just uh, sine theta over 2. That would be the area for this triangle. But wait, there's more. What if you compare that uh, with this triangle here? making a right triangle here, keeping theta here, the base is 1, but extending it so that this is a right triangle. Now, keep in mind, uh, we said this one is uh, sine theta over 2, this one was theta over 2, and we make it a fun exercise try to figure out what the area of this one is. Um, well, it's just base times height, so um, as usual, the area would be base times height divided by 2. And of course, in this case, it would be basis 1, the height would be, uh, you could call it h, and this would be the tangent, so the tangent uh, of theta would be h over 1, so it's just tangent theta, of course, all over 2. That would be the area. So this one is uh, tangent theta all over 2. Now using these three shapes, that inspires us to write the following statement. Uh, well, not that one inspires us to write the following statement. It says that, uh, let me see if I give myself some more room, uh, sine of theta over 2 is less than or equal to theta over 2, and that's less than or equal to tangent theta over 2. So that puts us at a nice place here, a nice observation here. This area is smaller or equal to that area, and that's smaller or equal to that area. Now watch what happens when we clean this up. I could get rid of the 2's and exchange this for a sine over cosines, and that would leave me with the following expression. Sine theta is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to sine theta all over cosine theta. Again, got rid of the twos, just by multiplying everything by twos. And the sine I exchange it for a sine over, or the tangent I exchange for a sine over cosine. Now keep in mind, we're trying to get uh, to this inequality, and this doesn't look like it, but again, we can just make small little tweaks on it and get there slowly. I'll divide everything by sine and that will give me that 1 is less than or equal to theta over sine theta and that's less than or equal to 1 over cosine theta. Again, because I'm going from the positive side, I don't have to worry about sine being negative or positive, or I know it's positive from the positive side, maintaining the, the direction of the inequalities. However, I want to flip this. The legal way to flip it would be to just um, invert everything so that, and then I have to change the uh, signs of the inequality. Uh, in other words, uh, the, if I flip this fraction, it would be smaller than them, so I would have that cosine theta is less than or equal to sine theta over theta, and that would be less than or equal to 1 over 1. Uh, this is just a fancy way of flipping fractions and changing the sign of the inequality. Well, it's not that fancy, it's just algebra. But again, this is a really nice, uh, nice uh, milestone here. We got this amazing inequality uh, with the thing we want squeezed in between there, squeezed between cosine and 1. Now I'm going to do my slapping here. I'm going to go with uh, the limit as theta goes to 0, again from the positive side, and we'll make that white. And I'll slap the limit here as theta goes to 0 from the positive side, and I'll go here with limit as x or theta goes to 0 from the positive side. And observe what happens here. The limit for cosine 
this theta goes to zero. Well, there's nothing there. You just plug it in. Of course, that this is one. And that's less than or equal to the limit as theta goes to zero from the positive side of sine theta over theta, and that's less than or equal to one. And voila, success. What we've done here is uh, we've shown that um, that this guy must exist, first of all. It's got no choice to exist, and it's got no choice but to be squeezed between one and negative one, uh, with the uh, inevitable conclusion that uh, that limit is equal to one. I told you. Super famous, squeezing at its finest. All right, I think that should do it for today. See you guys next time. Peace.